you're serious about your goals and the RP Diet app is here to help. It creates a diet for your specific needs, lets you choose your favorite foods, and tells you exactly how much of them to eat and when. Expert System AI guides you along to keep you on track to your goals. For less than $15 a month, you have one of the most powerful diet coaches in your pocket. Cutting edge data science tailored to your exact goals. The future is here today. Folks, we're back. Welcome back to the weekly webinar. Dr. James Hoffman, Dr. Mike Isratel, the famous one from Facebook, as you all know, here to answer your questions. Mike, we ready to roll? James, just glad to be here with you hosting another episode of weekly webinar. Somebody, uh, on one of the YouTube, somebody was like, is this available as a podcast? I'm like, what's the difference? It's a YouTube video. Like, you know what I mean? Like, People love their podcasts. They like to upload them, download them, load them up, so to speak. I know, but it's like the same as if you get like, if you watch it on YouTube or if you have a podcast app or what, I don't know. I just thought that was Yeah, funny. I think like, so one thing that I sort of see where you're coming from is like, let's say they have a long flight. You can actually cache podcasts for a flight, but you can't do that with YouTube videos. I thought you could so download stupid. YouTube videos somehow. Maybe you can, that, that person is fucking stupid. Well, I'm stupid because I don't know, but anyways. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we actually got a pretty good good list of questions for you guys. Let's, so let's get into it. Oh, All right. Here, don't I? Oops. There. All right. James Mendenhall says, James calling me out on my name just for that. I have a whole <laughs> slew of mini cut questions for you. <laughs> I remember that. He's, uh, he's, he's getting me back for that one. Yeah. He says, for my last deload, I started the week with my normal Monday and Tuesday. Training then took the next five days off and felt great heading into the next week. Generally, you two seem to say auto-regulation is the way to go. So assuming if everything feels good, uh, keep doing it till I need the sixth or seventh day. Is he talking about the deload specifically? Yeah. He's basically hmm. saying he's only deloading half the week and just taking the other half week off, and he interprets that things are going well hmm. as auto-regulation. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's fine. I, like, I wouldn't say that that's a, a bad thing, but you also have to weigh the cost benefits. So like, what do you lose by taking those two extra days and just being like really, really recovered before starting your next mezzo? You're missing out on like two days of training and you're getting a lot of security and longevity for the next several months of training. So it's definitely an okay way to do it, but you're going to have like, what you don't want to do is say like, I had a, uh, my one day where I felt really great. And that means I'm going to go right into training. You want to have a couple great days in a row before you really move on to the next one. That, that would be my suggestion. For my next deload, I would like to add in cardio. I was hoping that I could do non-load bearing cardio, like bike or row machine and still hit the kind of, still hit the cardio kind of hard while still giving the joints a break. I and mean, you can, it, that will work to give the joints a break, but the rest of your systemic fatigue and your muscle sensitivity to growth may be hampered by cardio. So there's nothing wrong with cardio and deload. I would just say, you know, the usual amount of cardio you do in your accumulation phase, the deload cardio should be cut significantly. So maybe half of it. Um, I do jujitsu during my deloads, but I usually do less rolls or easier rolls or usually some combination of both and oftentimes fewer sessions. So just don't make the cardio, don't just change the cardio modality from load bearing to non-load bearing and do the same or more of it as far as calorie burn is concerned. Uh, I would say do less, James. Yeah, and just for a reference point, I'm, I'm going to highlight this since I'm screen sharing, right? Here's where the thought process kind of goes wrong. I would like to add uh, something yeah, during deload, yeah. right? If anything, you should be reducing something. Now, here's where we can play devil's advocate, right? Whereas if you're thinking you'd like to use those cardio modalities as your standard cardio for the next several mesocycles of training, can you introduce it during a deload? Sure, that's fine. But you shouldn't be adding more cardio than what you were already doing. If anything, you should be doing less. So you can make a switcheroo and say like, I'm just going to do some low intensity, like cycling or, uh, you know, row machine just to familiarize myself with the movement and the modality so that I can train it in the weeks to come. But I would not, you know, go in with the thought process. I'm going to add like more cardio during my deal. That's probably a, uh, an incorrect strategy more often than not. Yeah. Another devil's advocate there is maybe he means add in cardio to a deload where he usually wouldn't have it in, but he has it during his accumulation. So another way to say that was mm. conserve cardio from accumulation to deload. I sure hope that's what he means. Um, James uh, Mendelhall, if you mean that add in cardio, like James took it to mean, don't do that. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Yeah. All right, a man that exclusively uses his brilliant mind to penetrate the computer systems of various governments and organizations, Daniel Hacker. <laughs> he loves penetrating, folks. That's his job. Ew. Need your opinion. I've been rolling with dumbbell split squats for a long time and would like your advice on if it's time for me to switch the movement to keep it in. Background, I trained the move for uh, three cut mesos, had three weeks of active rest, low volume phase, where I did it in a lower rep range and much less volume, and also had it in this previous mass meso. It was totaling 18 weeks or something. The move does not feel stale, check mark one. I actually have been progressing quite nicely. 75s in each hand for whatever, up from 60s for similar reps. Okay, great. I don't know if I should keep it in for one more meso or just switch it out whilst the going is still good. So I'll do, do this answer right now. If you are not feeling stale and are progressing quite nicely, the only other thing we need to know about this fundamentally is, does it nag anything? Um, is there an injury impending? And let's see, he says, I would hate to be in a situation where I think it's good, but now a couple of weeks of my accumulation, I shit the bed, it gets stale and I'm stuck. Remember, or, 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 staleness doesn't get you stuck. Staleness just usually buys you at least a meso of being like, ah, eh, this isn't the greatest thing in the world, but it still works. Remember, moves don't just stop working. They just work incrementally less and less and less. And especially if your first check marks are good, then really I don't think you have anything to worry about. 3.5 meso is a long time to keep the same move in. Not necessarily. Like some moves you can keep in much longer. Uh, really is move to move. Um, mind you, with the same average reps and slightly more sets, but man, I still feel like I have a PR in me. That's very good. I think get the 80s for the same volume accumulation. Uh, shoot my shot or bank the move for future progress. So remember, we have a checklist, and this is coming out in the, the um, to-be-released-this-year book, but we've already spoke about it multiple times on RP+. Plus. It's a very simple checklist. Checklist number one, is the move feeling psychologically or physically stale? Checklist number two, is your progress on the move continuing or has it stalled? Checklist number three, is it irritating anything? Like, are, is your elbow really bothering you on this kind of bench press? Or for your example here on the split squats, you know, is your knee bothering you? Is your hip, is your grip bothering you? Uh, shoulders or something like that. Um, if the answer to all those is in the affirmative, that is to say the move uh, doesn't feel stale, you're having progress, and you're not really uh, hurt, because James and I can speak till we're blue in the face about proactive variation, which we do and we will in the book, but if you really shit test us and push us, if all three check marks are there, James and I really can't tell you to stop doing the move, and we would have to honor our own scientific knowledge and understanding and saying, look, fundamentally, it's probably a good idea. Now, if everything's a real, real good idea and everything's going super great, but you know this is a move that eventually will cause you problems because you've done it for too long before and you know the going's been good before and then all of a sudden it causes you injury or something like that from overuse, then you might be able to sort of cut a move off and replace it. Or if a move is something like not appropriate for a certain strength phase or something like that, like sometimes holding dumbbells makes no goddamn sense when you're trying to do sets of five because your pros first. But outside of most of those very special scenarios, fundamentally, if you're checkmarking two of these things, that's usually fine. Three, for the love of God, there's no debate. Keeping it in is totally 100% fine. Now, just real quick, and before James plays cleanup on this, um, you, just because you're getting three checkmarks on a move doesn't mean you have to keep it in. You can change it. But keeping it in is absolutely crystal clear a good idea, James. Yeah, and I think that was a great answer. And the only really thing I, I would add is sometimes like you want to proactively use variation after you've kind of hit the peak and mo are moving into diminishing returns on a movement, right? So you are still making returns. They're just getting diminishing over time compared to like when you are really maxing out that movement and making huge amounts of progress. <laughs> Ugh, sorry. Oh, my God. Choked on my own spit. Sorry, um, James. Sorry, can I uh, put in two su super related points real quick? Um, yeah. Uh, that works for progress. It also works for staleness. The move is not stale yet, but you're not super excited about it anymore. So you can't say it's stale, but it's not amazing. And also for injury, your knees don't hurt yet, but they're starting to feel mm, kind of like, oh, that was knees, right? It's like, you know, next muscle are going to hurt. That's when you use proactive variation, not when you're everything's hunky-dory and you're like, I better stop now. Like, but everything's great. James, yeah. Sorry. So it's kind of a counterintuitive thing. So sometimes you actually use proactive variation when the getting has been good, right? Where it's like, this seems to have been working and I seem to be otherwise fine. That's sometimes a good time to come around to the thought of like, I've, I'm, I've probably milked this to the best of my ability, even though I'm still making gains and maybe not as good. Maybe it's time to sw switch it out. And the, so the goal is to never get to the point of plateauing or staleness. You want to get, it happens. And you, you know, there's no perfect world where you can always prevent that. But using the proactive variation can kind of help you skirt that in many times. So it would be a good, I, I would say at this point, like you don't have to change it, um, but also consider like, 
might not be a bad time to switch it out to, yeah. depending on what you want to do. Proactive variation, though, is as James uh, not just implied but stated, you, you, you got to have a feel for like, okay, maybe the next mezzo isn't going to go well. And a lot of people say, how do I do that? That's just something that comes with training wisdom. It is something that beginners will never understand, intermediates will begin to understand, and the advanced will start to know well. Um, you know, the, Daniel, you said that you're totally good to go uh, for another PR. You really feel it coming. Dude, fucking knock it out. Do another mezzo. Where you, you will use proactive variation in the case of the performance check mark is, you know, you hit PRs in this last mezzo, but fuck, you had to move heaven and earth to do it. And like, maybe it's a cutting phase. So you know that shit's not coming around. Or even if it's a massing phase, you're like, man, that took everything for me to hit PRs. And someone's like, do you think you'll hit PRs next mezzo? And you're like, Ah, I don't know. Then maybe proactive is tied. It's fine, right? And, and frankly, I think PRs is a good time to think about using the variation. Like if you hit a huge PR on something, assuming it's not like week two or the end of the first mezzo, mm-hmm. like if you're like two months in and you hit a PR, that, that actually might be a good time to think about moving on to something else because usually PRs take a lot out of you too, when you, even if you don't feel like they did. Um, so that's, that's another good kind of proxy estimate place you can use. Connor Gann says... Hey, Docs, just to clarify for my uh, last week, I meant lectures on here, not gear. <laughs> oh, that's right. I remember that. <laughs> We were like, what? And I'll avoid further questions on mini cuts that James doesn't have a belt to have JK. Oh, yes, thank you. Anyway, my question this week, it would be sweet if he said regarding mini cut. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, anyway, my question this week is regarding getting as close to optimal as I can with the time I have. Currently, I have four days to where I can spend 60 to 75 minutes in the gym and get most of my needed work done. However, I've been implementing mini sessions at my house with dumbbells and resistance bands for laggy muscles to get them to MRV. Do you guys have any tips on this? Is there a minimum threshold per session volume? For instance, sometimes in the morning before work, I'll do one set each of biceps, side, and rear delts. Thank you again for your content. It's great. I think the one set thing works and it will cause robust growth. I would bet on something more like two to three sets. Basically, we want you to be able to checklist something like this. Did you get somewhat of a pump? Did you uh, feel a lot of tension and disruption in the target muscle? And does that hang in for at least some hours afterwards? Like if you can leave a workout feeling exactly as great as you did coming in in the local musculature, you can't tell your biceps have been trained. It's unlikely that you're getting full expression and possibly you are just under your threshold for moving much of anything as an advanced lifter. So these workouts have to kick you in the ball. So if you have only time for three sets, maybe one day you can do three sets of biceps. And then another day you could do three sets of side downs as opposed to splitting that all up so much that you're really just kind of warming up. Now, another quick recommendation I do have for you is if you're only training four days a week, especially for the major muscle groups, I would recommend you to train closer to failure than we normally recommend. Uh, Maybe start mesocycles at one or two reps in reserve and quickly get into one rep, zero reps, so on and so forth, because uh, you are short on time. Cumulative fatigue is not a big problem for you because you don't have the volume in your program to really make it a problem. What is a problem with you is an under um, an under stimulative situation. So smash, smash, smash that fucking close to failure training. Um, James and I have programmed for many clients where they have two days to lift. They do everything basically to failure because you, what the fuck are you doing RAR for? You're never going to accumulate any fatigue anyway. You got to get everything you can at every set. So uh, just train a little bit harder. And I think you can make up some of that uh, lag of time, James. Yeah. And I think as far as the home workouts go, try and get that up to, I would say closer to three sets each. Right. Um, And if you have to just like superset your way through it and go to failure, as Mike suggested, or very close to failure, that would be perfectly fine. I think like doing the one set, like you probably can stimulate growth, but usually when we're talking about like minimum effective volume, we say minimum effective, meaning like the, the least amount that you can do to get tangible, to get measurable progress. Like one set is probably enough to like, if you were in an exercise physiology lab, they would say, yep, progress was made, but you will not know the difference for the next five years. Right. So we want something yeah. that's tangible. I would say, get that up to like three sets. And if you're really pressed for time, just superset your way through it and go to failure. And it, I think you'd be a slightly better off than just going like one set, calling it a day and then yeah, moving on. 100%. Um, all right. To Brandon Armstrong. It says, yes, that's my real name, and no, you cannot have it. It's a fucking sweet – that's an all-American name. That right is a very there. American that's name. A, that motherfucker's like an astronaut or some kind of like, you know, like uh, <laughs> fucking – you know, that's who the president picks to, just some, to do some special like mission. Like former mar- Marine turned astronaut turned politician. 100%. Oh, that's Brandon Armstrong. He's a good man. Tell you what. It's basically like John McCain. 
Yeah, or Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong quickly got the fuck out of the spotlight because he's a she's a trippy guy, man. Yeah, that movie was really interesting. Actually. Dude, that movie was fucking weird. Like, it was weird. <laughs> it was like he's mopey, bad things happen, then good things happen, then he's still mopey, and you're like, sweet. He's very emo. Yeah. Uh, all right. Brandon Armstrong says, first, I want to thank you guys for writing Scientific Principles of Strength Training. God, that was eons ago, man. I don't mm-hmm. even remember writing that book. That was a long time ago. Uh, but thank you so much. Uh, it got... My list progressing again uh, after a year and a half of frustration and lack of progress. It allowed me to finally know what the fuck I'm doing with my life, or at least the parts of it I spend in the gym. Also, the Sports Scientist podcast is in need of a new episode, preferably with more impressions and conversations between said impressions. (laughs) (laughs) We just do a podcast where we're having conversations within our like impressions of you idiot. Yeah, I could easily do Forrest Gump for a whole episode. Marcos could for sure do Arnold and uh, James. You could do uh, nerd guy. Nerd guy. Nerd guy. Yeah. Whoa. What a weird hangout. Of why would all, why would those people be in the same room? Yeah. Right. That's strange. We need some context. We need a, a backstory. Yeah. Um, all right. And he says, anyway, as far as I'm aware, this isn't exactly your guys' specialty. I'm under the impression you probably know a bit more about getting strong and jacked. The problem is that I can't find much on mild training specifically, let alone mild training in the context of concurrent training with powerlifting which I know has to have at least a few important differences from 5Ks and certainly from marathons, which make up the majority of training uh, info available for running. I figure that as sports scientists, you guys are at least more familiar with many aspects of running training uh, than I am and or some of the other knowledgeable people who know about as much, uh, know as much about mile training as you guys do about getting strong and more jacked. I train primarily for powerlifting, though I do have no, I have no foreseeable plans to compete, just improve my numbers. I don't plan on getting any bigger than 175 to 180, maybe bigger depending on how my lifts and mile time are at the, uh, at the time at five foot 10 so that I can still be a moderately fast runner while still being able to move some moderately heavy weight, at least compared to gen pop. I also try to train a running relatively fast mile and I'm aware that compromises have to be made because of this in both endeavors. Mm-hmm. I've had some success with breaking some of my unimpressive high school track PRs at body weights of 15 pounds heavier than I was back then, about 10 years ago, by trying to take some uh, of the info I learned about 5K training and a few books like Hybrid Athlete and Jack Daniel's book on running while still lifting and making pretty uh, decent progress in the area as well. However, I've reached a point where I was before lifting, just running consistently three times a week running six times upper lower for lifting and training hard with an attempt to progressive overload is not resulting in improvement beyond a 518 mile. God damn, that's a good mile time for somebody who weighs 180 fucking pounds. Um, and I really want that sub five at some point before I die. I realize that part of this may be due to a need to run more frequently and consequently lift less frequently. Cause very, very good idea you're having there mm-hmm. uh, more on that later. The problem is I don't know how to properly manipulate the variables to make sure that I'm moving through my theoretical mile training volume landmarks as I do landmarks for hypertrophy and strength, if I were to add uh, more of something, I don't know what I should do more of. Currently, I do one 45 to 60 minute long run, one threshold run, one VO2 max interval session per week, then each, and I try to slightly increase the volume of them over time. And then after a couple of months, reduce the volumes and increase the paces, slightly repeating the cycle. I don't even know for sure uh, if what I'm doing is the right ballpark, let alone correct. I'd like to know what the variables are and how to manipulate them micro to micro, meso to meso, and how to include phase potentiation to this if lack, applicable, all in the context of concurrently training for powerlifting to some degree, though I'd prioritize lifting if I had to choose one, just to progress in it while the other is a maintenance for now. To be honest, um, I'm hoping you guys can provide some insight or at least point me in the right direction. Sorry for asking such a huge question, uh, but for all of you guys, uh, might just be a bag of answers uh, for this and nobody has bothered to ask, so I thought I'd give it a shot. Thanks. Can I just chime in real quick here? Yeah. So I, I, I don't know if maybe I'm just being a dickhead, but... Um, a lot of the things he's, you're asking about, my man, are actually covered in the hybrid athlete. Like a lot of that stuff, like which variables to manipulate, volume, intensity, face potentiation, how to incorporate with powerlifting, like that stuff's all in there. I think maybe you're just getting too tripped up on the fact that you're trying to do a mile run versus like a 5K or anything else. He, like He gets to that literally next paragraph, James. So okay. he says, anyway, I appreciate it. Uh, any info or whatever info you guys can give on this or maybe pointing me in the right direction, uh, good people from reading on it. Um, Reading the hybrid athlete helped me a bit, but Alex didn't really cover the mile training aspect all that much, so I know enough to make sure I'm not doing too much of both. But I don't really know what I should be doing in regards to concurrent powerlifting and mile training. Specifically, I just know that it would be a bad idea for me to try to take some random uh, mile track workout designed for dedicated specialized 
pound high school track runner and you run it continuously in conjunction with training through the volume landmarks in regard to lifting, I'm looking to learn the principles so that I can program my running as intelligence I can for strength training from thanks to your guys' books. So here's the deal. You can take all of Alex Viata's approaches from the hybrid athlete um, and scale them to running the mile. The, the real big question is how much uh, difficult, how difficult is it to do mile run training and how much fatigue it spills over into your lifting. And you can adjust your lifting to reflect that no problem. So really the question is, are you lifting after you're running or before? Whichever one you specialize, that's the one that should come first. Generally speaking, lifting should come before running because you can always run after lifting, but not the other way around. Um, and so what ends up happening is you should probably be lifting first and your heavy lower body workouts should come probably before your, your hardest uh, runs. Uh, and then you should scale the rest of your training uh, appropriately. I, I do, I'm at a, at a loss, James, for how to train. I mean, I know how to train for the mile theoretically, but I'm at a loss for book recommendations of how to train mile running in general. I will say um, that your plan does lack a face potentiated model, which works really well for mile run training, Brandon. Uh, so what I would say is actually, what you probably want is multiple weeks strung together of work capacity training, essentially slower running where you build work capacity, multiple weeks of uh, threshold training where you really, really push your lactate threshold a ton, and then multiple weeks of peaking training where you start running distances close to a mile again and, and run more of them at competitive paces. Now, you should be doing some of all of those things in every phase, but the first phase is characterized by more base building work capacity work. The second phase characterized by more of lactate threshold work and the last phase characterized by more competitive pace work. So I would say that's a good idea. And then you just got to find your volume landmarks for running. How much running really, really beats you up for too much more running or lifting. How much lifting beats you up and scale appropriately. And I mean, you're training with weights a lot. Uh, so be ready to scale that back, especially in your last phase, which is the competitive phase in which you do mostly very similar two mile runs and paces, that's probably when you wanna start training like something like four times a week instead of six. And you, you might not actually be running much more, you just need to buy more recovery time so you can express your abilities more and finally get that five minute mile, James. Yeah, so I had a couple things here. So the first thing you gotta really recognize is a 518 mile time is pretty good, right? And you have to consider that running like all things, no matter what the context, uh, there's only so far that you can go, right? And the further you go, the slower the gains are going to be, right? And so you're going to see basically like a limit, like a calculus. So we call that like an exponential type curve where you're just at some point, like getting from 518 to 515 is going to require you to move quite literal mountains in terms of effort and training and stuff. So at that point, right, you're trying to get to like a professional running pace while not being a professional runner, you're trying to do powerlifting at the same time. And you already recognize that there's a compromise. So just keep in mind, right, like you have to have some realistic expectations, like people don't just break through like some of these times while training everything else at the same time, it almost is disrespectful for the people who are really accomplished, you know, on some of these things. And I'm not saying that's, that's your mindset, but just keep that in mind, right? If you're doing powerlifting, it's unreasonable to think that you can hit like pretty uh, getting close to like professional or elite level running times. So that being said, looking at your training, I agree with Mike, uh, you're kind of incorporating a lot of stuff week to week when really you probably should be focusing on maybe one or two of these things and kind of asymmetrically training them where you have a couple mesos that are more on your distance side, a couple mesos that are more on the threshold side, and then a meso or two of just pure like mile run type running activities uh, at different intensities. Um, the thing with a mile run is it's really just like an anaerobic threshold type thing. Uh, it's a lot of pain tolerance. It's a lot of just glycolytic activity. So, um, you probably don't need to spend a huge chunk of the year doing the long, slow distance stuff unless you just get out of shape. I would spend, I would bias more of your time towards threshold stuff like lactate threshold and above stuff as much as you can. And um, you can do interval training, although I don't really see the benefit of the interval training here because it's going to be at, uh, done at an intensity that's way above what you're going to be doing for the mile run. And it comes with a lot of baggage uh, if, if you're doing like high intensity interval training type stuff. So 
I would say that for health and for fitness, it's, that would be fine. But specifically for trying to get to that one mile run threshold, you might not need to do that. And I would kind of bias more towards the threshold stuff and then eventually just doing kind of like time trial type stuff. Um, it also begs the question, like, why are you so um, tied on the one mile run? It's a perfectly fine goal. I'm just kind of curious, like you could incorporate all of these things as like a holistic, like um, cardiovascular health uh, and longevity type program. And that would be amazing. Um, but I think trying to do all of them in the same, you know, week for p periods on end is probably violating a violation of phase potentiation. That's where you might be having a hiccup there. Um, so just keep in mind, so basically kind of TLDR, getting any more than 518 is going to require you to make some major changes. Like, like Mike said, you might even just have to do less powerlifting just to free up resources and recovery so you can express your cardiovascular fitness more. I would kind of bias your training more towards the threshold stuff, uh, but also incorporating some long, slow distance in there from time to time. And then eventually moving into more like time trial type stuff when you're peaking. Um, and that's it. The, 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 the theory, the variables, all that stuff. It's the same stuff that Alex, I read that book, so I know what's in there. It's the same stuff. It's all the same stuff. Like you're going to be looking at distances, durations, intensities, heart rate, all that same stuff. It's just in a, it's just contextualized into one event now. So that's the only difference. So don't get too caught up on the, no, there's no, there's no book that you're going to find. That's like how to, to do a mile run perfectly because um, I think you're like one of a hundred people who really care that passionately about their mile run time, not to, not to diminish your goal at all. It's just not a popular thing. Whereas like five K's and marathons and triathlons and, and the like are very popular. Yep. That's a very good answer, James. It's uh, a lot of that comes down to taking basic principles of volume landmarks and proper training and essentially, uh, you know, following them to design the kind of training that you know at fundamental level makes sense. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. All right. I think he had one more for you. One last quick question for Dr. Mike. This is actually for both James and I. Um, I know you used to be a professor, mm -hmm. so did James. It says for Dr. Mike. Yeah, well, you used to be a professor too. Uh, so, and the way you take really complicated topics and make them simple enough to feel like I was only three seconds away from coming to the same conclusion myself, <laughs> though let's be honest, I wasn't. How do you develop the skill of teaching things so well aside from knowing what the fuck you're talking about? Okay, that's really important. Um, as I'm sure, you know, being knowledgeable on something alone doesn't necessarily make you a great teacher of that thing. Uh, yeah, so, you know, some of what I say may not make any sense or may be wrong because I think I probably inherited a lot of my teaching ability genetically from my dad, who's a professor and is a gifted professor. He's been, he's won a bunch of awards. So, uh, boy, can that man gab his fucking mouth off and so mm -hmm. can I. The apple didn't fall far from the tree. Yeah, right hanging out with me is painful because all I do is fucking yap. Um, uh, hilariously enough, when I'll do like, um, uh, you know, if I, uh, a lot of people, so like psychedelic mushrooms, right? Which I've never taken, of course, because I'm a decent law-abiding citizen. Uh, a lot of people, when they take them, they just shut up completely or they can't form words. You know what I'm saying? In Ultra Universe, your boy is on a fucking one-man comedy routine for four hours straight. <laughs> so it's just sometimes you can fucking talk, right? Um, but talking alone is not enough, right? So not only do you have to be verbally expressive, shit has to make sense. And like you said, it has to be simplified. I, gotta, I, I do have a cool trick here that might, might work. You have to understand what you're teaching so well that you have to be able to, in your head, boil it down to the simple concepts that make it work. A lot of people hide their misunderstanding with an obscene amount of terminology and, and complexity. They'll say things are really, really complicated, eh, but maybe sometimes they're not so complicated. And once you understand something at a very, very simple level, which you have to seek to do and it's hard sometimes, then you can start to teach it at that simple level with analogies and descriptions and people are like, wow. And you also have to have a, a statistical understanding of the world. You have to be willing to generalize and understand how generalizations work. You don't want to be mired in the details. So when someone says, you know, for example, are men taller than women? You say, yeah, on average, that's absolutely the case. And so you, you can say, just like men are taller than women, you know, this one breed of dogs is bigger than this other breed of dogs, right? Uh, chow chows are bigger than Pomeranians, though I subsume they look almost identical for every other thing. So when that's the case, you know, a lot of people will say, well, gee, man, it's really not true that all men are taller than all women. Of course it's not fucking true. 
So you have to speak in a statistical way of means and averages. Once you break concepts down to on average this, on average that, on average that, you can link them in relatively simple relationships and then it's no big deal, right? But if you get mired in crazy details, there's a time and place for that. But that time and place is not teaching concepts to people for their first time. So you say, you know, strength training tends to produce the following results in most people. And then all of a sudden you're teaching them super simple concepts. And then in version two of that class, the graduate version, you go, okay, remember when you said strength training does this and that? They're like, yep, totally. You're like, okay, now let's look at the complexities. So a lot of times it's trying to understand the complex concepts at their most simple and then teaching that. It requires you to know what the fuck you're talking about. It requires you to understand concepts at a very simple level, but it also requires you to have a statistical understanding of the world and realize that there's no, uh, you're never going to get penalized for speaking in broad strokes. You know, what to you might sound like me simplifying is to some other people it might sound like me being completely unnuanced and oversimplifying, right? Somebody may hear the idea that uh, chow chows are bigger than Pomeranians. And the first thing in their head is, well, I had a Pomeranian that's bigger than the average chow chow. Well, that's nice. Here's your congratulations. You don't know statistics award. Go get fucked somewhere, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But on a serious note, uh, you've got to be able to understand things in generalities and be comfortable speaking in generalities but also understanding that it doesn't cover all the nuance in the world. James, you got anything to add on how to teach people simple stuff? Um, yeah, that was really good. Um, I'll actually take a page out of uh, Jordan Peterson because I've been listening to a lot of his bullshit lately. Um, and one of the things he recommends for his, um, he has like a, a writing program. I don't subscribe to the writing program. I've only heard him talking about it. But, you know, one of the things that he's really big advocate on, and this is kind of circling back to what the question and, and you were talking about, Mike, is um, when you're right, sometimes you have to look at what you wrote down. If you're trying to express an idea or something like you're trying to teach something, uh, you might have to go back and look at it like several times over and rewrite sentences over and over and over again and really try and boil it down into kind of the most concise, simple, like easily stated thing that you can, because a lot of times people get caught up, like Mike said, in making things overly complicated and trying to use big words and trying to string all these different various thoughts together. But what really helps as a, an instructor and as a teacher is where you can really consolidate and focus down on something that you're looking at and speak very concisely on it, very plainly on it. So you don't get kind of a wash of noise on the topic, right? Whereas um, it's very easy, like when you're talking about something like strength training, to get really caught up in like, there's so many things, right? There's exercise modalities, there's frequencies, there's intensities, there's volume considerations, there's SFR, right? So when you're speaking on those things, you really have to kind of narrow it down and one break these time. ideas down one at a time into the most plain kind of concise language that you can. And I think that's really helpful for, uh, for writing and for teaching. And it really also forces you to consolidate your knowledge into like plain, simple thoughts that can be conveyed to somebody. And so one of the tricks I like to use with my students when I was teaching was, can you explain this to your mom or your yeah. grandma, right? Yeah. If you can do that, you probably have a pretty good grasp on it. Yeah, that, that's a great answer. All right. Uh, Aiden. Aiden says, Hi, Mike and James. Sorry for the amount of questions. Aiden, you are a paying customer of RP Plus, so you do not have to apologize ever. Question number one. You were going to say you are a paying like, pain customer. Maybe both. <laughs> Question number one. In one of your lectures about rep range periodization, you say to bias more volume in each mass cycle to each of the three rep ranges 5 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30. I can remember you saying in a podcast that it was good, uh, that a good plan, a good plan, that's very important, not the good plan, would be a 20-week mass, four-week maintenance, and then a fat loss phase. With myself only being able to accumulate volume for around five weeks before needing a deload, this equates to three mass cycles of five weeks, that's 15 weeks, not including deloads. To extend this math fa mass phase, would you recommend just doing another meso, biasing the volume in a 10 to 20 rep range again, as that's likely as the vast SFR? No, I would not. Uh, so in all four, it would be four mesocycles massing. No. So what I would do is have a first mesocycle that slightly biases the exercises that you can do really pretty far into that five to 10 range or heavier, right? The next mesocycle could be like a mix of five to 10 and 10 to 20 and a little bit of 20 to 30. The next meso could be, you know, mostly 10 to 20, but sort of uh, even all three. And then the last mesocycle can be a lot of 20 to 30, a uh, little bit of 10 to 20 and very little five to 10, right? So just because there are three of these uh, rep ranges, that doesn't mean you have to cap out at three mesocycles. It's not like one gets one, one gets another one. Remember, it's always a blend for each one. So you just blend it a little heavier in the first, a little less heavy in the second, less heavy in the third, and least heavy in the fourth. That's it. 
Um, the reason you don't want to end on a 10 to 20, remember I, we said that uh, 10 to 20 likely has the best SFR for most people in most situations on average. But that unfortunately doesn't work because when we look at the 10 to 20 range, it's lifting heavier weights than the 20 to 30 range. And by meso four, if you're able to survive three mesos, you may not be in a joint situation where you can lift very heavy weights for high volumes anymore. So progressively weights should, introduction of new volume should occur usually with lighter and lighter weights with concordant exercises, because as you go through a training block, like a mass, mass uh, like a massing block, your joint fatigue starts to accumulate and you're really going to do the more of your heavier lifting is going to occur in the first mesocycle. You're still going to do heavy lifting throughout all of them, but you're probably not going to add to the heavy lifting. You could add to the moderate lifting and then add more and more of the lighter lifting as you go, James. No, it was really good. I don't have much to add on that. Cool. Question two, saw your Instagram where you did a compound isolation and then another compound. I read the comments and saw someone calling it the isolation sandwich. We made up that term in one of our muscle guides. Um, it's so tasty. Are you able to explain what the benefits of this uh, and who is it best for and when? It's absolutely not for people named Aiden. So <laughs> that was clear. I hope you read that. Um, so the isolation sandwich is not some kind of miraculous technique. It's a special thing. It's actually just built on really simple principles. Principle number one, uh, high force compounds are usually the best for growing faster twitch muscle fibers and they're best to do fresh because faster twitch muscle fibers are best trained fresh. So, um, cause they, they basically accumulate fatigue faster than any other fibers. So if you do too much pre-exhausting and training fast twitch fibers at the end of a bunch of exercises, they're already just dead. They just do, don't do anything and you just accumulate more fatigue for no fucking reason. So what we do is like a heavy compound at first, let's say a bench press with uh, you know, sets of five to 10. And then the next thing is you want to keep hammering your chest, like your chest is your target. So what you might want to do is you can choose between another compound and an isolation. But the cool thing is, is that it, so uh, the downside of doing another compound is if you do another compound, like, yeah, your front delts get a lot of work, your triceps get a lot of work, so does your chest. But what if we want to reduce the amount of uh, front delt and uh, tricep involvement and really make sure our chest is the limiting factor in that, in that compound, the second one that we use? Well, the way we do it is we put an isolation before it. So now that we've done a real heavy meat and potatoes work in the first compound, the next thing we do is isolation to really toast the chest. So the next time you do another compound, so let's say we do flies, then when we do incline dumbbell press, your chest is so fucking toasted, it's for sure the limiting factor in all of your movements that it gets the most focused work while keeping the volume uh, relative effort and load down for the incline dumbbell press so you can save your front delts and shoulders for another session that they are prioritized in later that week. Remember, we do not recommend, so who is this for? It's for higher level folks that really want to target one muscle, especially a hard to target muscle that gives them trouble with reachability. Sometimes people have trouble, they'll say I bench press, I do inclines, I just never feel my fucking chest, I don't know what the hell's going on. The isolation sandwich is a great tool for them, not really use it with people who have limited time and want to train their whole bodies in three or four sessions a week, because then isolation sandwich just makes everything you do after for your chest and you have trouble reaching all your other muscles, James. Yeah, that was good. The only point I wanted to highlight, which you hit on the end there, was it's probably more for advanced people who benefit more also from the increased intra-session variation, whereas like intermediates and beginners, you know, beginners, like one exercise per muscle group, you're good. Intermediates, maybe like one to three. Advanced people might actually need to have more, uh, you know, two to four exercises per muscle group simply because they... Uh, the trade-off of doing more than a few sets per exercise starts to become increasingly negative. So their kind of optimal MAV might be like three or four sets on a movement, but they still need to fill in more for that same muscle group. So they have to start switching out using more and more movements. So definitely more of an advanced strategy, but can still be used by intermediates. Uh, but you don't, it's not like, it's not like you're missing out if you're not doing it. And the isolation sandwich just basically lets you hit two big check marks. Check mark one, are you getting the compound heavy stuff with no limiting factors? That's your first compound. Check mark two is, are we really making sure the target muscle we're doing is the limiting factor in a bunch more high volume work after? The way you do that is isolation and then compound after. Excellent. Question three, in my gym, I regularly have people come up to me asking you what to do to build muscle. Do you have a few sentences of what to say to them? Yes. Lift weights and eat food. Yeah. Boom. The, the eat food stuff uh, is for sure true, but let's just assume it's about training. 
we actually, I'm going to read you a sentence from the upcoming book. Holy shit. Oh reading. my God. The spoken okay. word on RP plus. Here we go. This is the RP plus difference. So what you can tell them is the following. This is a direct, this is us in our overload chapter, trying to boil training down to legitimately two sentences. Okay. Here it is. Do multiple full range of motion sets of five to 30 reps that take three to nine seconds each. Take them close to failure where the target muscles force production is the limiting factor and repeat this approach as often as you are recovered enough to do so. That's it. Ta-da. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, right, so train hard and when you recover, train again. Yeah. So, I mean, like you, people might be like, oh, Dr. Mike, duh. Like, nah, nah, nah. But it's, it's not an easy thing to boil down into a couple sentences. Obviously, there's a lot of nuance there. There's, like we said before, there's volumes, intensities, exercises, yeah. all sorts of stuff. But that's ultimately like where everything kind of consolidates down to that idea. So Yeah. And it's actually a pretty good two sentences because someone's like, okay, so what about sets of three? Nope, five to 30. What about sets of 35? Nope, five to 30. What about not going close to failure? Nope, not a good idea. What about not full range of motion? Bad idea. What about waiting uh, like a week after my muscles already covered to train it again? No. What about training the day after when it's still not recovered? No. Like just those two sentences alone encode quite a bit of training structure. And remember, if someone really needs two sentences worth of advice, boy, are those two really great sentences. Now, can we do better? Yeah, sure. You can have them just study under James Krieger for a year and they'll know everything, but maybe they don't have the bandwidth for that sort of thing. Not to mention we're writing a goddamn book about it. Right, that's For how sure. much we have to say about it. A very it. large book. And funny enough, that has like three prerequisite books you should almost certainly read before <laughs> you read our books. While you were reading off those questions, like, should I do this? No, should I do that? I, I was thinking about the meme with the, with the hand coming down on the gas button. Like, should I do yeah. this? Like, gas. <laughs> Boom, do it. <laughs> Yeah, I just wrote the uh, introduction for the book, actually. And we have a couple of books that we're recommending. Uh, we won't get into what they are now, but the, the, the biggest one we recommend before reading our book is Brad Schoenfeld's uh, Hypertrophy Textbook. And I basically am like, look, you don't have to read this book, but you should read this book. You got to read this book. <laughs> like, you, you, you do actually have to read this book. Our, our book won't make any goddamn sense. Because the, the thing is, people will be it's like, what's a motor protect- unit? Like, nope, nope, nope. Just just a preview, guys, for those of you who know and have friends that are interested in buying the book. The book is designed and dedicated to be exclusively for advanced individuals. Like this is not a book you're getting for your mom, right? There is a book in, like that. Intellectual Art of, advanced. Right. Yep. This is the book that um, – there is a book like that called The Art and Science of Lifting with Greg Knuckles and Omar Souf that you can get everyone. And that's actually our first prerequisite book that we recommend people read. So, but anyway. Yeah. All right. Question four. I'm about – I am soon to be working in a gym as a personal trainer for the next few months, and naturally, I'm quite nervous. Good. You should be super nervous and yell at people when you get upset. Um, lash out at them. Lash out. They're, they're the, what's wrong with you. I have been an RP Plus member for nearly a year now, gone through most of the lectures, watched uh, each week's weather, and have all the RP books. I am oh, also, on average, watch at least one podcast per day. Holy shit. And I'm subscribed to Mass to stay up to date on most relevant studies. I've also recently purchased some university style textbooks on clinical sport nutrition recommended to me by RP live chat. Um, I feel I have the knowledge. Yeah, for sure. Fucking have the knowledge. But as I keep learning, I realize there's so much more to learn LOL. So I'm wondering what are the key things that make a good personal trainer? Well, none of that shit actually. Um, That's your ability to be a very pleasing personality and to make people do two things, Uh, work hard and enjoy themselves. Think about it. If someone's working hard and enjoying themselves, there's just a win-win situation. A lot of trainers are really good at making people enjoy themselves, but they're not working hard, so they suck. A lot of people are making people work good at people uh, making people work hard, but the people don't find it enjoyable, then they just leave you at some point. So what you want to do is make people work hard, uh, coax them into doing it while having a lot of fun and enjoyment. And um, a big part of that is easing people into the process. You don't want to be like, okay, we're going to do everything perfectly. Forget perfect, forget flawless. Personal training is not about that. It's about putting together a fundamentally decent plan and teaching them the techniques and pushing them a little bit further, a little bit further on most sessions, inviting them to do a great job, inviting them to buy into really good technique, congratulating them on their performance. When they suck, you don't say you're bad, just say, you know, I think it was okay. I think we can do better next set. How about we rest a little bit and do it again? And that way they grow with you, learn with you. And remember one really super important thing I'm gonna tell you right now, you know so much more than the people you're training you can tell them to do anything you want 
try stand on your head and they'll do it because they think it's a good idea because that's what they're paying you for. They know fuck all about anything you're going to tell them. So don't worry about like, oh, but James Krieger said sets of six and Mike Israel said sets of eight. Whoa, what do I do? Like Jesus fucking Christ for love God. Just make them do relatively full range of motion lifts. We go back to those two sentences we said earlier. That's fucking good enough for most personal training and most of it comes down to motivation and just being a good person around them and, and having fun with them, James. <laughs> Yeah. And you also have to keep in mind, right? Like personal training is a business. It's a private sector job. You are there to please. You are there to sell sessions and make money and you want it to be a win-win, right? So you are not supposed to just be able to regurgitate all this information that you soaked in for all these various sources. You are dealing with a live person. You have to build a relationship. You have to build rapport and trust and confidence. So a lot of it actually goes less on the, the X's and O's and more on the interpersonal skills. And I think for personal training, that's arguably just as important. And if you want to go by numbers, I know plenty of people uh, in personal training who do really bad training, but are ex- have excellent people skills and they probably are the top tier money makers. So it depends on how you look at it. I would encourage you to do the best job that you can with the knowledge that you have, but also keep in your back pocket, right? It's a business. You don't want to sit there and ride like your scientific high horse if it means you're going to lose clients or the clients are going to be un- ultimately unhappy with the service that you're providing. So treat it like a business. Understand that you have another human being that you're interacting with and you can be ride as rain all the time. You can wi- ride that high horse, but if you do it in such a way that makes that person not like you or not trust what you have to say, you're going to lose business, homie, and that's not a good way to do it. And we know plenty of people who have done that and they struggle. So keep that in mind. You're working with a human being now. It's not about like, well, I read in, in you can drip that you should be, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it's not, it's not about that anymore. It's about how can I get this person to do what I want in this situation within the real life constraints that we have. Yeah. And just a real quick thing. I mean, I used to teach a course on, on how to be a personal trainer for a long time. So I got fucking boatloads of shit on this. I can keep going, but fundamentally your job is to tell them what to do and do a quick justification for it every time. And then the rest is, just motivation and being the friend and counting reps and looking at their technique. Uh, so you're going to be like, Hey, okay, so we're going to do squats now. Cause we're going to target the legs. Sound good. And they're like, ah, uh-huh. like almost nobody's going to be like, Oh, was there quads or rectus femoris or what the fuck? Nobody, people don't buy personal training sessions that know that fucking much. Right. They're going to train them, them God themselves. The thing is they'll be right up shit Creek without a paddle. If they do ask that, cause you could be like, Oh, you want technical knowledge. And then you shit out 30 seconds of nonsense that they don't even understand. And they go, Oh wow, this guy knows what he's doing. They probably certainly never ask you that shit again. So don't have to justify everything you do. Just quickly be like, hey, we're doing chest uh, presses for your pecs and your shoulders and triceps. And let's uh, get it warmed up here. They do the warm up. You're like, great. We're going to do heavy sets of five to 10. I want you to push it. But good technique is number one. Got it? And they're like, got it. And you're like, all right, get going. All right, good, good. Press up and down. Excellent. A little deeper that time. Good. That's four reps. Let's get two more. One more rack. That was awesome. Here's water bottle. Take a break. We're going to take 30 seconds and we're going to snatch these these pull downs and back and forth, back and forth. That's it. That's personal training. Fucking nine times out of 10. That's all you're doing. And if they ask now, so why are we doing this versus that? You can give a, you know, the next leap of justification. You don't have to download all of humanity's knowledge into them. Be like, well, we're targeting the quads because later we're going to be doing hamstrings and we want our hamstrings to be fresh. Cool. And they're like, okay. And at nine times out of 10, they don't give a fuck. And actually nine times out of 10, the reason, James, you ever notice this personal training? The reason they're asking you a question is to delay you from making them do another exercise because oh, yeah. they're out of breath. Oh, yeah. Like, but you'll catch on to that if you have remote social skills. And you're like, hey, yeah, totally. So it's, uh, of course, we're keeping the hamstrings fresh. Got it? They're like, uh, uh-huh, but like, yep, yep, time to do another set. They know that they're there to be tortured by you. So fundamentally, they always shut up and do what you say. Personal training yeah. is not that tough. Highly recommend uh, that conscious coaching book. I forgot the author, but it's on Audible. You can look look it up. It's really good. I've heard good things. I've been using the RP diet to fuel my weightlifting performance for years, and RP's simple science-based approach has been instrumental to my success. With the new RP diet app, following RP's principles is as easy as entering my goals and schedule and choosing my favorite foods. The app builds a diet to my exact needs, reminds me to eat my meals, and adapts to my body's changes every single day and week. The RP Diet app is a huge help in my quest to become the best athlete I can be. And if your goal is to be your best, it will help you. Question number five. Am I missing out on much if I'm having three, if I'm having chicken for three meals out of my five days, my protein source? No. For example, my meals are pre-workout chicken with potatoes, post-workout cereal. I was, I thought cereal with chicken. (laughs) I'd be like, "Uh, okay. Cereal with milk and whey protein, early afternoon chicken sandwich. Dinner, sometimes beef, but mostly more chicken. 
pretty bad oats with milk. Um, is there anything bad uh, having mostly chicken from a protein source? Although I'm having milk, I'm sometimes um, beef, some other sources. I think I heard something about maybe missing out on some other nutrients. It's not nonsense. You're a bunch of fucking nonsense. Uh, no, totally fucking fine, man. You That's can replace that with any building, complete man. protein source and be 100% fine. I remember Branch Warren used to be big on that. He'd be like, you need to get variety. I eat deer. I eat fish. I eat chicken. I eat beef. Like all on the same day. It's like, Branch, dude, are you out of your mind? like to hunt shit. Yeah. No, you're good. I eat chicken for almost all of my solid meals. Just because I don't easy. ever eat chicken because I don't let anything industrially farm touch this body, but I would. <laughs> <laughs> if I could only eat industrially processed foods, I absolutely would. It would be amazing. Mm. I don't want to eat. I just want everything introduced to me via nano robots. Is that so much to ask? I wish everything could be in like sausage form. That would be amazing. That is absolutely the most insightful thing about your sexuality I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. It's going to take more than that to throw me off my game. (laughs) Question six. Saw a few people on YouTube, a great uh, source of information. I might add, wait, shit, we're on YouTube. (laughs) I just shared our own podcast. Uh, saw a few people on YouTube taking a lot of salt before workout to get a better pump. Is there a truth to this? A little bit. A little bit. You've got to time it right, and usually it means you're just not eating enough salt anyway. If you're already eating enough salt, taking salt before a workout doesn't get you any better of a pump. But if you're chronically low on salt, which many bodybuilders are because they, for some reason, choose not to flavor the food because it's not clean, taking salt before a workout will absolutely give you a better pump. But guess what? You can eat salt all the time to be fine. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that was part of the NO thing where it was like carbs and salt at this time, then take your NO supplement. It's like so much to fuss with. Yeah, just take 100 milligrams of Anadrol and you'll have all the (laughs) (laughs) Don't do that. No. No, don't do that. Sean Murakawa Rubin says, hey guys, hope your 2020 is off to a great start. Sean, you know we love you, dog. So, But but here's the thing, just as pure comedy relief. We're gonna. <laughs> um, I never do understand at a deep, super pedantic, peculiar level. So mind you, all this is a joke. None of this is meant to be serious. Um, when people are like, "How's your 2020?" Like, motherfucker, we done invented the year. Like the sun, sp- we spin around the sun an extra time. Like, fucking, for the love of God, like. December 31st, January 1st, nothing of note changed that's irrelevant to any. Can you imagine like, man, 2019 was a shitty year. 2020 is going to be different. Why, motherfucker? You're still the same scumbag you used to be. You're still sucking the same shit job that you won't change. You've got no balls or skills. You know what I'm saying, James? I just, uh, like, no. oh, I hope your 2020 is good. Like, all right, I hope your random future amount of time is also good. I, I hope your past is good. I hope everything's fucking good. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I also think it's funny that we put so much stock into it when it was an arb- kind of an arbitrary start date as to when we started counting as time. You know what I yeah, mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. We've been around yeah. for a lot longer than 2020 years. Yeah, and- for sure. I, I, do, I do the Hebrew calendar, man. I'm like, it's 5715 or some shit for me. You know what I'm saying? I hope that shit is going well for you. Uh, yeah. Mr. Ruben, I might add, right? So, uh, all right. But in any case, that was all joke. Let's get into Sean's usually very, very insightful questions. Number one, what do you guys think about James Krieger's finding in his recent January issue of Weightology regarding the interaction between set volume and rest intervals? Specifically, the trend that's seeming to be more apparent in the data uh, that higher weekly set volumes, 30s to 40s in weekly sets per muscle group, with short rest intervals give roughly, roughly equal hypertrophy to lower weekly set volumes, 10 to 20, with longer rest intervals, and that the primary reason some studies show increasing hypertrophy up to such a high set volume is because they're paired with short rest times, so each individual set essentially produces less hypertrophy, whereas with 10 to 20 weekly sets, but longer rest times, there's fewer total sets, but each individual set produces more hypertrophy. So you can pretty much pick either lots of less stimulating sets or fewer more stimulating sets in the week, but either way, you pretty much end up at the same end point, sort of like a maximum hypertrophy cap per week. I mean, I think that as usual, James Trigger knocks this one out of the park. It's fucking brilliant. It's completely concordant with the data. It's absolutely expected. Um, what I will say is the following. They're roughly equivalent on a time investment. So, uh, you know, it takes you just about as much time to do six shorter reps, uh, shorter rest sets as it does to take four longer rest sets. What they are not equivalent on is the amount of systemic fatigue spillover that they cause. Yeah. shorter rest breaks that will cause sets to be less hypertrophic than others 
are by definition, the set, the next set is started before the muscle can be the most limiting factor to that movement. And thus, what you end up getting is a considerably higher level of cardiorespiratory fatigue, of systemic fatigue, and all these other things, so that you're doing the same uh, amount of, or sorry, you're, you're actually doing usually more physical work. And even if it's the same amount of work, it, it, so it's usually, you know, multiple sets are doing more physical work, but more of that work ends up relying on aerobic systems and on, uh, uh, on a variety of other pathways that aren't directly hypertrophic to that muscle itself. So what I would say is resting longer, better said resting long enough so that the muscle is the limiting factor, which none of these 30 to 40 set studies do because they, they do squats like every minute or every minute and a half. Like for sure, you're not doing eight sets of squats and still not breathing right. So what they end up doing is they do accomplish a, a ton of work and a ton of sets, but they end up doing this by relying on a lot of aerobic mechanisms and other supporting muscles. Whereas if they rested longer, the target muscles themselves would be the more stimulated ones, which means your efficiency of training escalates. Uh, in some sense, we could call it efficiency. It's not actually a stimulus to time ratio because you spend the same amount of time, but you're basically resting a very short time between sets so much that it affects your hypertrophy is actually adding junk volume to your program. So um, that's not a great thing. And if I saw somebody who was resting too short between squats and <gasps> breathing super heavy, you can clearly tell most of the squat sets are ended by their lungs rather than their, um, their legs. I would say, guy, listen, if you just rest twice as long, your quads are gonna get hit just as much with fewer sets, but your lungs won't get hit as much. And that fatigue you're accumulating from doing all those numbers of sets isn't going to fuck you up nearly as much and you can train for longer and more efficiently. James. Yeah. And so just keep in mind some like kind of basic base, going back to some basic exercise fizz here. Like if you take a longer rest time, essentially what you're trying to do is have each one of those reps at a higher intensity than comparatively with the shorter rest time ones, right? Because you either have to lower the weight or some combination of things to lower the reps or the reps to, to accommodate for the shorter rest time, right? And so this is kind of like differences we see in hypertrophy training for something like powerlifting versus bodybuilding, right? And powerlifting, we're typically going to do like sets of, you know, maybe eight to 10 with a nice long rest so that we can maintain a high intensity on each one of those reps. Whereas in bodybuilding, that trade-off is not as favorable, especially given that we don't need to maintain a high intensity and the systemic spillover of that high intensity is so nasty. We can absolutely open up those different rep ranges and they are roughly equivalently hypertrophy stimulating. So there's, there's a lot of nuance and trade-off there, but Essentially, in this case, like the longer rest, we're kind of putting a little nudge towards intensity, right? And with the shorter rest, we're kind of giving a little nudge towards volume, but, you know, they end up being pretty, pretty similar in the end. I think it comes down to this, like per our little sentence on what causes hypertrophy. What causes hypertrophy of a specific muscle is the maximization or increase in hypertrophic signaling in that muscle. The way that happens is a ton of tension, a ton of metabolites, and a ton of cell swelling in that muscle itself. Here's the trick. There is no trick to getting around that. It just takes a certain amount of physical work done by the target muscle. If you rest not long enough, you still have to do the same amount of physical work. You're just going to take you more sets to do it. If you rest long enough, then you can accomplish the physical work with fewer sets, but you're going to have to rest more between sets so you can really gather your shit to put in that physical work. It's almost like if we have um, like a, a glass and the glass, filling the glass is stimulating a muscle's hypertrophy responses fully, you can do a bunch of little fast pours or, or you can let your pouring glass fill up a little bit longer, do a pour, let it fill up a little longer, do a pour, and then fill up a little longer, do a pour. It might take three pours to fill it one way, and if you go to your, your pouring glass to the faucet and just get a little bit, get a little bit, get a little bit. It's sort of the same thing. The only real question is how hard is it uh, to go to the faucet and come back, go to the faucet, come back, go to the faucet, come back. It's some work. Six times of that is worse than three times of that. How much water do you spill in the spilling process? It's more. So I would say take as much rest as you need for the local muscle group to be the limiting factor so that you still spend the same physical amount of time in the gym, but you have less systemic fatigue, less junk volume, because the short rest programs will generate the same hypertrophy, but cost you more of that other bullshit. 
Yeah, and I think some of the recommendations that I've heard Mike make in the past, um, like using your breathing rate as a proxy for this, unless you're horribly out of shape, and if you, <laughs> in that case, it doesn't work. But if you're in reasonably good shape, even just uh, by bodybuilding standards, um, you, you, when your breath gets back to normal, it's probably a good time to go again. Yep. And if it's not back to normal, it might yep. be a little too soon, unless you're yep. deliberately going for that. Yeah. And when you feel like, like you do a bicep curl, someone's like, you about to do another set. You're like, yeah. Do you feel like this set is going to be limited by your biceps or something else? And if you can honestly say my lower back's going to get me this set or my shoulders are tired or I haven't caught my breathing or my nervous system just isn't ready to produce a lot of work. Like I still feel defeated. Uh, then don't start, start when you're ready. And a lot of times that's just a feeling you could cultivate over many, many years of training. Yeah. And just to put, just to like be clear, this doesn't necessarily mean we're, we're suggesting you should do the weightlifting style training where you do like a set of 10 and then go to McDonald's and come yeah. back. Yeah. Right. That's too much. That's too much time. I mean, we used to see that at PTSU a lot. Um, people would literally do a set of 10 and then do another set of 10 later in the day. And then yeah. the last set of 10, like in the evening, that was yeah. just cracking me up. Um, yeah, not that sure. long, but sure. just enough to kind of like my case. Yeah. Number two, I have a question regarding static set training which I know you guys aren't a fan of, but I'm curious about learning various perspectives and ideas. If someone was going to do a static set hypertrophy plan, would a good starting method for planning out set volume be to go to the RPI hypertrophy hub and for each body part, simply pick a number of sets somewhere in the middle of the given MEV range. So for example, chest is uh, stated at 12 to 20 sets MEV. So maybe picking something like 16 sets a week, hamstring stated at 10 to 16, picking 13 sets, front delt seven, et cetera. No, because you should know your own volume line marks much better than we can give you them on RP Hypertrophy Hub. If someone was interested in the RP Hypertrophy Hub doing a static set program, I would point them somewhere between MEV and MA and the middle of that MEV MRV range to start. So closer to MEV, and I would tell them to do a static set program there for one mesocycle. After that is done, they rate their pump uh, soreness, perceived exertion, so on and so forth for every muscle group. And be like, okay, so that eight sets of squats I did per week, did that really hit home or was it just really not enough or was it really much too much? And then they would adjust the static set for the next month based on their feedback from the last month. James and I are big fans of adjusting that every week if needed, right? So if clearly last week your pecs felt fucking nothing, you should probably do more this week. But essentially static set training is saying delaying that for a mesocycle. Still learn what's going on. Start lower because starting lower is a safer bet. It gets you less injured. Um, and it still produces great results. And then next time, next month, either raise the sets a little bit for everything because your ME, MEV is going to be elevated and, or to some extent, some muscles are going to need much more calibration. So I would say doing it that way is a good idea. If someone is really brand new, that is how to do it, but you're not brand new. So you probably know your MEV, MEV ish range, pick something at the lower middle of that and start there, James. Yeah. And one of the reasons why you can't just use your approach where you just jump in the mid, like a mid MAV range is because when you keep the uh, set static, you have to adjust the intensity in much different ways, either meaning training closer to failure more often than not, or taking really, really big intensity jumps week to week to actually keep getting something out of your program and satisfy that kind of progressive overload component. So the reason why that doesn't work is because you're treating the intensity in a way that we generally don't recommend on the hypertrophy hub guide. So it's one of those where you could try and just jump into like a mid range MEV, but because of how you have to handle the intensity because the sets aren't moving is going to be dissimilar to the recommendations that we use in the hypertrophy hub. Therefore, those numbers can't really be used. So Mike's recommendation of starting somewhere, maybe around MEV, see how the intensity influences those numbers week to week is a good place to start. Number three in the hypertrophy hub, you guys say that front delts MEV is only about six to eight sets due to all the fatigue uh, and stimulus actually from chest work. With an MAV so low, uh, many bodybuilders easily doing 20 to 30 sets of shoulder pressing a week. Does that mean most bodybuilders are essentially chronically doing dozens of sets of junk volume for front delts? Or is there some credence to the idea that maybe after years of doing what might originally be way too high volume, they can build a tolerance to high volume actually benefit from 20, 30 sets of front delt work? Yes, there is some credence to the idea, but hold on a second. Almost no one is doing 20 to 30 sets of shoulder pressing a week. Most bodybuilders, and this has been established in a number of studies, one of which Brad Schoenfeld co-authored, most bodybuilders train every muscle group once a week. Some very few train it twice a week and fucking the rest of the very tiny minority of actual people who compete in bodybuilding train muscle groups three plus times a week. The ones that train three plus times a week are usually intelligent bodybuilders that know all the stuff that don't do you know, five sets of shoulder pressing three times a week or more, or actually in your example, six to 10. Um, I don't even know anyone who does six to 10 sets per session what I will say as far as overhead pressing work or shoulder pressing work, most pro bodybuilders that do the one uh, session a week thing 
James, what would you say? Like the Flex Magazine thing, it's like three to five sets of incline dumbbell press at the beginning of the workout, and then everything else is reared out in side belt. Yeah, I was going to say, man, I don't know where you're getting that number from, uh, those 20 to 30 shoulder pressing. If you were going to say 20 to 30 sets of delts per week with some shoulder pressing in there, I'd, yeah. I'd say, yeah, okay, sure. Um, and some that might even be once one session in some cases, which I'd still be like, yeah, that's probably a lot of junk volume, but it, it does work. The other thing too is like, even at, at some of those um, seemingly kind of comical sets, I mean, like drugs do a lot of great stuff for you. Now drugs aren't going to be the, the quick fix answer to this kind of situation, but yeah. Uh, are you going to build up a, a much higher tolerance to doing uh, like, let's just say delt work in general, maybe not overhead pressing. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the big benefits of using drugs and most pro bodybuilders are on, on that route. So um, I don't, I don't agree with the notion that they do 20 to 30 sets of shoulder pressing per week, though. I do agree with you. They're probably doing delts at that level. Um, but, and only a small fraction of that's probably going to be shoulder pressing. If they were to do that much shoulder pressing, God, that would be such a horrible trade-off. Your triceps would be fried. Your, sh your shoulders would be fucked at all point at all times. You, I didn't even think you could do anything else at that point. Yeah. The systemic spillover is massive on that. Yeah. But this right. point, I was I was literally thinking about somebody like doing like uh, seated barbell shoulder presses for like thirty sets. That's what I was laughing. I mean, when you were one workout that's not going to work. But even spread over the week, that's fucking crazy. And it, you know, people do crazy shit. I just don't know anyone. I've never heard of a bodybuilder doing this. So, yeah, I'm just just kind of curious where you where you came up with that, my man. Yeah. All right. Thank you too, as always, Sean. It's our pleasure as always. Always excellent questions from you. Uh, unlike Martin Kumaru, who only has dog shit questions. Oh, God. <laughs> What's this up, guy. Martin? Hey, Docs. It's been a while, but I'm glad to be back. Glad to have you back. Number one, generally, I generally find that sumo squats, wide stance, leg presses, etc. do nothing for my glutes. My preferred stance on leg press is medium height going wide enough that my knees touch the side of my shoulder when the sled is resting. Yep, uh, I like that stance too. As far down as I can tell and feel it 100% in my quads. That's good. So that's good for leg press and quad development. It's, uh, it's maybe if you're trying to use the leg press for your glutes, I would say I wouldn't do that. that's just the wrong exercise at that yeah. point. Okay. This is actually part of the same question. It took me a second here. I have reduced functionality in my nostrils, about 50% of normal people due to a childhood injury. So anything that is very systemically taxing, high rep squats, lunges, et cetera, it's pretty much out of the question because it oh, ends up getting sucks. me limited by my breathing instead of my muscles. Yep. Yeah, big deal. I've been getting around this by doing exercises that are less dependent on breathing. Hip thrust, for example, first to make the following exercise more limited on my muscle. Great, great use of your sure, situation. Yeah. However, I, I'm still finding trouble getting enough variation due to limited extra selection. I've been all right for now. Four sets of machine hip thrusts with a three-second hold and squeeze at the top. Uh, absolutely destroy my glutes. But I'm running out of ideas on what to do. Doing lunges afterward is mostly fine, but still feels partially limited by my breathing. I tried a machine that was kind of like a donkey kick, but the horizontal is not a vertical. Yep, that's actually a really good machine. I, I like that one. I'm getting burned in a bit of my quad that connects to the knee. Yeah, that's possible. Uh, um, I'm still experimenting around with different exercises, but I was wondering if you guys have any clue on one of you helpful exercise or anything in general. So I think a pretty exhausting method is great. I would recommend slightly heavier lunges in the 8 to 12 rep range can actually target the glutes more than lighter ones. The glutes seem to preferentially um, get hit with heavier weights. Uh, whereas the quads get hit with lighter weights and many people, not all. Um, and another one is, dude, just go to Brett Contreras' Instagram uh, and <laughs> or sign up for various materials he has. Brett has literally invented like 20-odd glute exercises. All of them have something you can take away from. He's got so much shit, you'll be overwhelmed with that shit, and most of them are not systemically fatiguing. So uh, that's my biggest recommendation. You want glutes, Brett's the guy to look for yeah another one i would add in is um like the barbell lunge where you actually take a backward step it's much easier to really focus on the glute rather than taking a forward step at least in my experience um i would also shit i had another oh so normally i'm not mike and i aren't big on these kind of like very silly um particular recommendations but i'm going to throw one out there just because i think it's apt here a lot of the times uh, your foot position and uh kind of the pressure point that you're pushing on your foot can make a really big difference in the muscle activation on some movements not all but there are times where like if you push really hard on your toes like on a leg press or something for example you'll feel it really really burning in your quads but if you can keep your foot in the same position and push on your heel you'll see the distribution of your muscles changing a little bit and so with the glutes one thing that i recommend is playing with the foot position certainly uh, but also doing a little bit more heel focus 
focused drive on a lot of the movements. Like I was just thinking about the donkey kick. And if you were pushing with your toes, you might be getting a lot of quad action on that just from the way you're pushing it. But if you do it in a such a way that you're really pushing on your heel, and I know this is such a minute thing, but I think it's, it's applicable here. I find that the heel is a really good place if you're trying to get like posterior chain activation. After that, like Mike said, Brett, Brett is the glute guy. But I think what you're doing so far is really good. Number two, I was wondering, I saw Mike's Instagram post about how Charles Banks, okay, so his Instagram is Charlton Banks uh, after Carlton Banks, the, uh, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air star. Um, his name is Charlie Jung, actually, but that's hilarious uh, that you are saying that. Uh, it's a fine assumption, by the way. Has made great progress in the last six months, and also remember how Mike said that his arms used to be a real weak point. Charlie's arms or my arms, I wonder. As someone who's chest is their number one weak point by far is there anything mike Ch charles did slash change besides more volume we didn't necessarily do more volume uh that really helped you grow uh, a lot of it is finding the frequencies and average mavs and exercises that are the highest stimulus to fatigue ratios like we tried training biceps uh five times a week and four times a week and that was a bit much we went back to training them three to four times a week, and that was much better. We've been experimenting with various exercises, like, for example, incline dumbbell curls or something I used to not like, but I really learned a good technique on it, and that's a really phenomenal exercise for me now. And as well that's a good Charlie. one. Yep. And um, sometimes you just have to find new exercises and find uh, something that basically lets you groove. You're having great sessions, great pumps, great soreness, healing on time, and building strength slowly over the mesocycles and that's how you get really good results incline dumbbell curls one of those awful ones where like the burning and the pump is so fucking just it's just painful it's just awful but you know it's working it's a good one 100 percent. i have trouble connecting with my biceps in general like a lot of exercises i'm just kind of like ah this is hard but i don't know and then incline from, dumbbell curls, from masturbating like, wow. too much yeah, or not enough <laughs> Number three, I've been experiencing something odd that happens every once in a while and was wondering if you could explain it. It's a total inability to progress on an exercise despite progressing on an exercise that targets the same muscle. For example, for hams, I did seated ham curls and stiff legged deadlifts in the past four months. My ham curl went from 30 kilograms for 12 reps to about 65 kilograms for 12 reps, holding it for a second while I contracted to make sure I'm not using body English. I know I'm obviously, I know obviously some progress is neural adaptation and all that jazz, but my stiff legged deadlift went from 115 kilograms for 10 reps to 120 kilograms to 10 reps in the same span of time. Uh, that's not terrible. At first, I was wondering if perhaps it was due to doing ham curls first, but the only difference between doing stiff leg deadlifts and doing them first versus after ham curls is a five kilogram increase. The thing is, the stiff leg deadlifts still smoke my hams. I get deep, painful stretch, not much of a pump. Uh, but they're sore the day afterwards. Ham curls give me much more of a pump and not much soreness the day afterwards. I have the same thing with biceps. My regular dumbbell bicep curl has been 20 kilograms for the last year. Uh, but I still get great pumps from it and progress on all the other bicep exercises. So a lot of things is neural adaptation. You're just used to that exercise. You're about as efficient as you're going to get. If you give the leg curl another six months, I doubt you're going to put out another 30 kilograms onto it. Uh, another thing is because you've been rocking out on hamstring curls and increasing how much work you do so much for them, that might actually have accumulated fatigue that interferes with your stiff leg and deadlift making gains because, you know, you did 30 kilograms for 12 reps. It's only going to fatigue you so much. Now that you're so neurally efficient, you do 65 kilograms for sets of 12, they might actually fuck you up for the stuff like another you do in another part of the week. That's at least uh, one suggestion. Um, I also have to say this, and James, let me know if you think this is right or wrong. I wouldn't, you know, I would always seek for the highest SFRs, always get the best technique, but as long as some exercises and the average exercise is going up over time for a muscle group, I wouldn't perseverate too much about some that don't go up. Sometimes weird shit happens. You might have a limiting factor muscle groups that, that's what uh, yeah, like your lower back is the limiting factor. And that's what, that's, what, you know, what's holding you back your glutes. Who knows? It might actually be your systemic uh, nostril issue, right? Uh, hamstring curls don't make you breathe all that heavy stuff like it do. So it could be that it could be a bunch of stuff, but if on average your hamstring exercises are going up and especially if the isolations are going up, you got nothing to worry about. James. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, that, that, that was actually the route I was going to go was, um, you know, with something like a stiff legged deadlift, there's just more degrees of freedom, more opportunities to have weak links in the chain. Whereas like you have technique, you have lower back, you have glutes, you have hamstrings, even just getting the bar out of position a couple times will throw off your whole set, right? Whereas like on an isolation movement, although sometimes you can't generate a huge magnitude of stimulus, right? 
there's nothing really to fuck up except for that one joint and one muscle that you're training, right? And so when your hamstring curl goes up that much, it's definitely a, a, a combination of neural, but I would say probably some muscular adaptations as well. And that's bolstered by the fact that your stiff legged deadlift is going up. The problem is, it's like if you see um, one going up rapidly and one kind of going up, maybe not as much. It's like, well, why is the other one not going up as much? Well, there's no way to know because that one just has so many other things that could go wrong. The fact that both of them are going up is definitely an indicator. You have an isolation and a compound movement for that same muscle group, both of which are making progress. What more do you want, homie? That's good. That's all good. That's all you know, gravy. I would say you're given how much your hamstring curl uh, went up, I would say you're definitely making some really solid progress on that movement and your hamstrings. So that's good. And just keep in mind, right? There's, there's like no degrees of freedom on that one. It's like, okay, hamstrings, and that's about it. I can't really fuck this up. Whereas the other one, like it could be any number of things. You could have done too many pull-ups the day before, and now you can't hold the bar in position to do the stiff-legged deadlift. I've actually run into that problem. So yeah. there's a lot of things that could go be, be contributing to that. Number four, to continue in the not progressing line of questions, do you have any exercises that just don't go well with you? I've tried variation after variation of the barbell bench, uh, flat, low incline, medium incline, Smith machine, flat, low, close grip, medium grip, wide grip. Taking extended breaks from any benching and then coming back. The thing that made me think the exercise is just not for me is using kind of like a bench press machine thing. It's a flat bench and has a handle for each hand, functions for all intents and purposes, kind of like a Smith machine with two handles. Anyway, just like with barbell benching and all variations, I progressed for about a month and a half to two months going from 40 kilograms to 85 for eight reps. My barbell bench has been stuck at 85 kilograms for over a year. And then any progress completely stopped. Essentially, I was just gaining back lost neural strength with very minimal increases in weight, if any. I could not even add a rep, coupled with the fact that I could not get a great stretch like I do with dumbbell bench or a good pump. I can't get a pump, but it takes like four sets of flat bench and three sets of incline to get the same pump, four sets of dumbbell bench. Give me, well, there, there you go. It just seems like very met exercise for me. I only kept trying to make it work for its... Uh, for this long due to how great everyone thinks it is. It's a shitty reason to try to make something work, by the way. And because I would lose a large amount of variation if I did not do barbell bench whatsoever. What do you guys think? I think there's tons of pressing exercises. You do not ever need to do any barbell benching. If the barbell bench, here's with the great, the SFR rating scale. If the stimulus it gets you is really awesome, and if the fatigue it gets you is concomitantly not so great, you got a great fucking exercise. And if the opposite is true, then fuck that exercise. You don't ever fucking have to do it. Uh, that's it, man. James? Yeah, there's and like if DBs are working for you, you, there's infinite DB variations, believe it or not. You can play with the grip. You can play with the degree of incline, right? There's all sorts of crazy DB stuff. Um, you can play with fly variations. You can do push-up variations. There's no shortage of like chest stimulating exercises. Just because you're not doing a heavy bench press type movement doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong, contrary to that it seems to be like common practice. So you can just throw that out the window, right? If you get huge pumps and huge stimulus from doing like cable pack flies, who cares, right? Fucking you can up. always make up the extra like front delt and tricep volume through other exercises later on too. So I would say give the cambered bar a try. Play with your technique if you haven't done that already where you really get the elbows to flare out rather than tucked in like powerlifting style. Make sure your elbows are coming out, stretching out. Try the cambered bar bench. I'd say that's the last one. And if that one's no good, you can throw it away and just stick with your dumbbell pressing, your push-up variations, your fly variations, and you're probably no worse for wear. Yeah. Maybe a couple of years later, you can try some barbell pressing and it might actually be good for you then. I've done that where I've come back to exercises years later with a lot more insight, a different body, and then all of a sudden it works super well. Yeah, totally. Um, all right. Number four, what do you consider to be a roughly adequate amount of cardio done to maintain health and, and general cardio per week? I walk about 10,000 steps a day and spend half of my total work week to about 20 hours standing up. I'm not sure if I should add actual cardio as well. No, absolutely not. Is it just as long as you keep your blood pressure and pulse under X value, then you're fine I'll, I'll pretty much. Mostly. I would say anything north of 5,000 steps a day is good enough for general health. Uh, 10,000 and above is really just great. So uh, you for sure don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I mean like the ACSM recommendations for like minimum cardio uh, benefit threshold is like a cumulative, like I think it's like 20 to 30 minutes per week. And that's cumulative, right? That's from all the days in the week. So yeah. you don't need much to get a lot out of it. Number five is the last thing I wanted to ask about calves, specifically variation. If I have to do more than six sets of an exercise before my overreaching work, I add an exercise. That's a good idea. But this is not really possible with calves since I could do 30 sets a week no problem recovery-wise, and I can't think of five calf exercises that are really that different. So I was running first. Are there really more than two variations, as in there's a difference between doing bodyweight calves on stairs, doing calf raises on a Smith machine, um, or doing calf raises on a calf raise machine where you have a pad on each shoulder, 
All three are technically different, but they all load the calves by loading the calves vertically. Okay, so do squats, leg presses, hack squats, etc. for quads, but we call those different variants. And by placing the load on your spine, besides the body weight calf raise, same thing with leg press calf raise. It might be different that it's a horizontal press. That's not different at all. The load's still in the same direction. But I'm not sure. Otherwise, all leg presses load the calves at a 45-degree downwards pattern. Unless I'm missing something, it just seems like you fundamentally have two exercises. But any variation as to be known, the rep range just pauses rest time. So we, we could actually say the same thing about every single muscle group. So vertical pulling, we could say pull-ups, pull-downs, assisted pull-ups, really all the same thing. We could say uh, all uh, hip hinge, uh, deadlift, stiff like a deadlift, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, glute ham raise and fucking 45 degree back raise and good morning. They're all the same. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit different, but the variation only needs something to be a little bit different. Um, and you can absolutely, like you say, uh, vary rep ranges, pauses, and rest times, for sure. Um, but those different exercises hit your calves just a little bit differently enough to count. So I would say those are absolutely for fine variants, James. Yeah. And really, there's with calves, and not to, I don't want to play into this discussion too much, but really there's two main variations, and that's those done with a straight leg and those done with a flexed knee, yeah. I should say straight knee and a flexed knee. Those are the really the two big differences. But all of the straight ones, I mean, like, yeah, they're loaded mostly the same way, but those are also tends to have like the best EMG activation for all of the calf muscles collectively. Uh, it's, it's a win-win. So I think that's plenty of variation there. I think that doing any of the bent knee ones for bodybuilding purposes is mostly a waste of time unless, unless you have a really good coach and he's like, bro, Got to get on that bent knee raise. I think the donkey <sighs> calf raise is probably the stupidest thing I've ever seen in terms of exercises. It's just, I don't. Ugh. There's something just so lame about it. Like our, remember in Pumping Iron where they would just do donkey calf raises all yeah. goddamn day. Just like you guys look so stupid, <laughs> so fucking dumb. There are a lot of exercises which is just not flattering to look at. Yeah, like you could do the same thing standing up straight and not having your friends riding you like a horse. Yeah, but why? But why? Be good. Ugh. All right. Our last question asker for RP Plus today before we get into YouTube says, Vikas, or is Vikas Hebar? And he says, Howdy, with regards to cutting calories for fat loss, can you talk about the pros and cons of cutting from diet versus added cardio? Uh, we have done this extensively in yeah. earlier webinars, which you can search on RP Plus. And we have done it in various books, including uh, the uh, Renaissance Diet book. But we'll do a real brief version here. It says, for example, if I wanted to cut 200 calories per day, is there an advantage to keeping nutrients the same and adding in lists? E.g. walking instead of cutting calories from food outside from time such convenience matters. Another more situational example, suppose I'm having a party in the evening and I plan to drink it, eat more than a lot of my plan. Is it better to pre-mitigate and create room for the binge via cardio or by cutting nutrients, skipping a meal beforehand, or is there no real difference up in personal preference? <laughs> I wouldn't get into this any of this bullshit at all, actually. I would just enjoy the party and then go back to your plan and... Um, just enjoy know the progress. No, you made a trade off. Uh, yeah, me. getting into the fucking binge purge exercise cycle is a fucking bad idea psychologically. Yeah. It just doesn't lead anywhere good. Um, but which one do you do first? Really, what the question should be asked is what are your relative uh, a, a, um, indices of fatigue slash hunger? So, for example, if you are quite hungry and not remotely fatigued, doing more cardio is good. Because cardio will add fatigue, but it won't make you any hungrier. Removing food will not add the kind of fatigue as rapidly as cardio does. Like extra cardio beats you up in a way that less food doesn't nearly on the same time scale, but less food will make you hungry. So for example, if your leg workouts are going super well and you're eating a ton of food, you're not super hungry, but you've been doing a lot of cardio and your leg workouts are kind of like feeling it. And you know that like if you keep doing this much cardio or add more cardio to generate more of a deficit, your leg workouts are going to for sure feel it because you're sort of having like dead leg all the time. Um, definitely remove food on the next round of, of adjustments. If on the other hand, you're pretty fucking hungry, but you're doing almost nothing, your leg workouts are totally fine, and you add in three cardio sessions a week at 600 calories each or whatever, and, and you don't feel it at all in your leg workouts, no real added fatigue or very minimal, but you're not burning calories without having to decrease food, because if you decrease food anymore, you'd fucking kill yourself with hunger, then clearly adding in the cardio is the best. Um, a lot of times it's a combination of those two factors, but really that's how you determine if one has gone too far than the other. Yeah, totally agree. And so kind of generally it boils down to like, would you be willing to suffer more through doing exercise or suffer more through starving? Probably there's a happy middle ground between the two. Only you can decide which is better for your lifestyle and preferences. Yeah. All right. Boom. Time for me to share the screen to go to YouTube. All right. All right. All right. 
Uh, all right. This is where we get to creep on what's what's being recommended for Dr. Mike and his YouTube. What did you do you see this, James? Can women defeat men in sword fights? <laughs> like, <laughs> what kind of shit are you into, Mike? I don't know, man. I don't know how the fuck this algorithm works. For the love of God, I've never searched anything related to sword fighting ever. You got you got women stabbing men with swords. You got Jordan Peterson and a couple over here. Looks like you got Joe racism Rogan. debate. Jesus Christ. No boy. John Meadows. Twenty one reasons your bias. That's a lot of reasons. That's a really high value video. That's a lot. Marxism. You getting you getting you going you thinking about taking a trip back to the former Soviet Union? Thinking about Yeah, definitely. Marxism? I haven't had enough of my life's fill of Marxism. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get to someone who's at the bottom here, but has a pretty good question. Samuel Turner says, Those who don't care about hypertrophy, next question. <laughs> <laughs> um but want to be more functional in everyday life, what do you suggest focusing on farmers' walks, weighted vest, cardio, mobility stuff? I'm thinking my goal is not specific enough because my PT put me on a bro split with most of it consisting of isolations. Please help. I'm paying $75 per session and would like to reach my goals. Samuel, I'm going to do a fucking solid. Go join a CrossFit gym. You want function? CrossFit is essentially the ultimate in function. You'll be great cardio. They're going to essentially make you do a bunch of weighted stuff, a uh, bunch of strong man stuff, and their core is built on compound, supersetted, heavy basic barbell moves and body weight moves. That's how you get in the best functional shape and the best health. Um, so just look into what CrossFit people are doing. Consider joining a CrossFit gym. And it's actually joining a CrossFit gym is significantly less than $75 per session. Uh, it'll get you in great shape. You'll make a ton of friends and it's going to be awesome. Yeah. And just keep in mind, like um, functional fitness, the, the word function implies like contextual fitness, right? So like why would you need to do farmer's walks? Are you a farmer? Are you going to be like, you know, carrying a wheelbarrow around all day? Like, so uh, right. if, if not, then what's the function there? So really, I think um, hypertrophy training as that we would generally recommend, you know, like a combination of full range of motion compound movements with some isolation movements in there, you know, usually between five and 30 reps. That is pretty functional. Like what doing, if you can squat for sets of 10, like there are very few things that you can't do for a normal person. Now, if you have like a super high level physical level job or, or lifestyle, then yeah, you might consider doing something like CrossFit. Absolutely. But it turns out like if you can pick things up and put them down in a variety of ways, <laughs> which is that's what bodybuilding and hypertrophy training is, it's good for your health and you can do most anything in your life. So I would argue that hypertrophy training is for activities of daily living is actually very functional. Yeah. Yeah. Try froze. <laughs> says, hello, gentlemen, greetings from Finland. Berkele. Here's a few questions. Pick whatever. And we're going to pick number three because I want James to weigh in on this. I oh, know no. this is going to light fire under James's ass. What is your view on strength and balances between one's bench press and barbell roll in the context of potential shoulder problems such as bicep super <laughs> <Okay>. neuropathy? <laughs> My five round bench is almost 15. My row is only 80. The imbalance uh, important, like some say, or is volume and load management uh, all there to reduce preventing overuse injuries or pain? Uh, my suspicion is that the imbalance stuff comes out of the clinical literature and is vastly misrepresented in literature and non-clinical people. I think the problem with imbalances is when something is so fucking weak, it gets hurt all the time, not that something else is really fucking strong. Uh, James, what do you think? Yeah, that's my understanding too. And so th it's, it's unclear to me that uh, having an imbalance in this case, let's say between like upper body pushing and pulling muscles or antagonist and agonist like push pull muscles, right? It's unclear to me that that actually contributes to uh, injury potential outside of very extreme circumstances. Now there are cases where um, like imbalances have been associated with injury. And one of those is cycling where the quads can become really, really overdeveloped and the hamstrings tend to lag significantly behind. And that tends to be associated with like knee injury and knee pain, but that is a very extreme example. And so for everyday people, and this hasn't, to my knowledge, hasn't really been clearly fleshed out for the upper body. The need for symmetry is largely a myth. It's it's actually more normal to be asymmetrical than it is to be symmetrical, right? You're supposed to not be uniformly strong across all muscle groups. That's the way that you are brought into this world. And that's how the average person is. So um, from the standpoint of like, should you be training to correct these imbalances? No. Um, unless, as Mike already pointed out, unless you're painfully weak in something, or in some cases you can get like reciprocal inhibition of like antagonist muscles from one. A common example is this, um, people who work at a desk all day, 
slouch forward, right? Their pecs end up getting tight and then they can experience some reciprocal inhibition in some of their scapular retracting muscles. But again, that's a result of their lifestyle, not necessarily um, that they're mm -hmm. doing something wrong in training. Yeah, very, very good answer. All right. Last one. Nicholas Luca Riccardielli. Oh my God, that's like the spiciest name we've had in a so while. Amazing. How much does my muscle comma technique matter versus going through the motions and moving heavyweight for hypertrophy? That's actually a good question. Yeah, it's a very good question. My initial suspicion is that it matters very little. And so fundamentally, like why are the IFB Pro so big? Because they do this, ah, 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 and, 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 and uh, relative effort, targeting the correct muscle, and doing some range of motion, even partial, is going to get you most of your growth. Everything else is bonus round, slash increasing the stimulus to fatigue ratio so that you can not break when you're 35, but break when you're 55 and accomplish everything you want in bodybuilding through the interim. Um, so technique doesn't matter a ton for hypertrophy unless your technique is so bad that it's significantly taking load off of the targeting musculature and giving it to other muscles and they're becoming limiting factors, right? So well, like if, your technique on, yeah, if your technique on bench press is like a close grip, you know, like my chest won't grow. Like, well, move your shit out and flare your elbows. And all of a sudden, my chest is growing. And you can say, well, I, I thought you said technique doesn't matter. Yeah, within what's generally a good idea. If your technique becomes extreme, then you're not hitting the muscles anymore. But if you feel it in the target muscle, we can't say much. Um, and my muscle connection matters very little. But what my muscle connection can do for you isn't that it itself boosts muscle growth much. It really doesn't. It can increase the stimulus to fatigue ratio significantly, which is to say that once you have my muscle connection, you can do with 30 kilos the same amount of stimulus you used to have to do with 35 and 40 kilos. That's less joint wear and tear, less everything, more systemic fatigue uh, fraction opened up for your other muscle groups, and you can just do a better job. The way that like Charlie and I train quads now, if I did this with how I used to train 10 years ago, I'd have straight died after two months. Like, but we do our squat technique, our leg press technique. And a mind muscle connection is so, so high that we essentially have this ability to not have to lift five and 600 pounds. We lift four and 500 pounds to get the equivalent amount of hypertrophy. And if you want to fuck yourself up after years and years of lifting, lift needlessly heavy. That's the way to do it. James. Yeah. So I would kind of clump mind muscle and technique into kind of like individualization strategies. Right. And you can, could, you could argue that there maybe could be in a different context, but kind of that's what we're getting at here. And what we find is that, you know, individualization of your training, uh, especially to generate things like high SFRs, is definitely a good idea, but it's not a critical idea. It's not, you're not going to be, um, you're not going to be leaving a ton on the table and you're not going to be making any fundamental errors by not individualizing things like your technique so that it stimulates more mind muscle connection and the like. You see plenty of people get by just fine just by moving the stuff around. And actually, Daniel Hacker had a question about this uh, several months ago. And I think we came to the same conclusion. Like, yeah, if you just pick things up and put them down, you're going to get growth to some degree. Power lifters are huge. Right? Exactly. Um, but if you can do it in such a way that's individualized to your own needs and uh, stimulating SFR, minimizing injury risk, right, all those things, you're probably going to get just a little bit more out of your training. And at the very least – what we can expect you have is a much greater longevity of training, meaning yeah. you can stay in the game longer. And that's probably one of the biggest benefits of bodybuilding and hypertrophy training because the longer you're in the game, the more time that you can accrue muscle, right? If you stop training, you stop accruing muscle. If you get injured or whatever, right, you're not gaining muscle. So the longer the time that you can be alive and training, the better. And that's something that individualization tech, uh, methods like that can help you get. Yeah. One example real quick is my training partner, Charlie, um, he used to be a, a basically a world-class powerlifter. Um, he squatted 800 pounds of competition raw with knee wraps. Um, and he used to do the training for powerlifting that it was essentially like the, the end limit of super hard training that moved going through the motions. Like powerlifting is literally going through their specific motions. Charlie was very muscular, but his body was a fucking walking wreck of almost injuries and sort of injuries and current injuries. And he was always in pain and his work capacity was always limited. And then when he started training bodybuilding style with Jared and I just recently, about a year ago, after six months of that, he basically has almost no nagging injuries. He's putting crazy volume oh, loads. He's more muscular than ever, not by a huge amount, but more muscular with no pain and no injury. 
God, is that awesome. So if you told Charlie, like, hey, I want you to low bar squat 700 pounds for reps, he could do it, but he would probably tell you to go fuck yourself. And instead, he would high bar with a pause for 55 and get m- this same amount of quad activation for much less of every other dog shit thing that goes with going super, super heavy. Yeah, totally. So that was, that was a good question. I'm, I'm glad he uh, brought that up. Yep. And that was the last one, folks. If you're on YouTube and you want your questions answered, you can continue to post them in the comments and we may or may not get to them, but we only ever do three YouTube questions. The thing is for RP Plus questions, as you note, we answer every single one and it's only 10 bucks a month. Uh, if you want to join, come join RP Plus. There's a link in every single video. So hit us up. Yeah. And a uh, secondary benefit for RP Plus, um, they post the videos on our website and they are ad free. And the YouTube, I think we start just getting, seeing some of those YouTube ads pop up every now and again. So if you want it ad free and your questions answered, RP Plus, baby. For those of you on YouTube, if you enjoy like RP's uh, stream, there's obviously the weekly webinar that Mike and I do. There's podcasts like my podcast with uh, Nick and Lori just got posted. There's a whole bunch of other fun stuff on there. Subscribe to RP. That way you'll get all the videos when they come out and we'll see you next time. Peace, homies.